Uh, okay, so let's move on a few. Next. Okay, so now I want to have sort of sharing session uh, and reflect together with you on what did you learn by doing these exercises. So please reflect on these three questions. What did you notice about how design works? How can you, uh, how can you make design work for you? So how can you take the learnings from today in your own work, in your own startups maybe, or in your own activity, in your own companies? What is one method or mindset you could use tomorrow? So already tomorrow, what kind of approach that you learned from today's session, you can already apply in your work tomorrow. So take a few minutes to think about these three questions. The people who are online, please answer these questions in the, um, not in the Google chat, in the Zoom chat, sorry. So again, what did you notice about how design works? How can you make design work for you in your company, in your organization, in your activity? And third, what is one method or approach that you can start using tomorrow? Okay, any other feedback, questions?
on let's move on to the next part for the people who are online i'm still waiting for the things uh, for you to write in the chat um, and we're going to continue with our session so now comes a little bit of a theoretical part of design thinking. I think we're going to be a little bit over time. I hope you're okay because we started late because you were late. Um, so I want to share with you a few things uh, about design thinking and give you some concrete examples as well. So five key principles of design thinking. First, human-centered design. What does human-centered design mean? is that you put the human at the center. It's not about your solution. It's not about what you think. It's about the human that you design for, the user, their needs, their problems, their desires, um, and then adjusting your solution for that. So to iterate, the problem that you solve are not necessarily your own, or many times not the problems that you experience. So these are the challenges of a specific group of people. Therefore, it's so important to practice empathy, in this case, in the form of interview, because interview really gives you also kind of emotional needs, insights. Uh, you can also do this through a survey. So for example, doing a survey is also another way to gain empathy, but to really understand the, um, what the other person is going through. So one thing about empathy is that Many times empathy can be confused with sympathy. So I don't, I, I'm not aware of the terms in Vietnamese and if they're similar or not, but empathy really means experiencing the problem yourself. So as I said in the beginning with the example of a blind person, if you are designing for blind people, one way to really experience that problem is to blindfold yourself for a day and try to live the life like that and understand what are different challenges that they experience. Sympathy is more like you feel sorry for someone. Like in this extreme case, if you see a, a poor person on the streets, you might feel sorry for them, but you will never understand the problems that they go through, the worries that they have, the anxieties they have, if you don't put yourself in the same uh, shoes as they are. So like to do a simple mind exercise. What do you see when you look at this picture? Okay, why do you say poverty? Okay, you look at the house. Mm -hmm. Facial expressions. What else makes you think that this is poverty? They don't have water. They don't have water. Important insight. Yeah, so this is a photo of a refugee camp. So people who fled their homes because of wars in the Middle East, and then they are camping somewhere else. And this is their living conditions. So you can look here and you can sympathize, right? You can say that, I see that this is poverty. I see that their lives might be hard because they don't have water. But unless you actually go in this camp and live here for a day, you would never be able to really understand what their problem is. If you just look at this picture, you will just say that, I'll just send them some water and everything will be fine. But if you actually live there, you will, try, you will get beneath the problem and you will identify that, okay, maybe they don't need me to go and give them water there. They actually need a place to sleep in. They need a house, a proper house. So this is kind of the difference between sympathy and empathy. So to give you a few examples of how empathy can be applied is, so there is this case of an embrace warmer so this is the embrace warmer around the baby. So in this case, there was um, a team of design students uh, in, in the US and they identified a problem through statistics. They found out that in Nepal, in mountainous regions, in, in rural regions, a lot of babies die, die prematurely. In the first days of their lives, they die because um, they don't have a proper incubator to save their lives. So when babies are born prematurely, so before nine months, they need to be in an incubator that um, warms them up, that warms their bodies to be able to survive. And they found out that in Nepal, in this region, a lot of babies lose their lives because of the situation. And this team of designers in the US, they could not really empathize with the situation because they were thousands of miles away from where the actually was where the problem was actually happening. And what they decided to do is they flew to Nepal 
to really understand, okay, where's this problem? Their assumption was that the hospitals are poorly equipped because it's a poor region, it's a rural region, the hospitals are bad, that's why the babies die. What they found out was completely surprising. They went to the hospitals, there were a lot of empty incubators in the hospitals, a lot of them. So they asked themselves, okay, why is this problem then still happening? And what they found out by interviewing different stakeholders, by digging into the problem is that many times the mothers, when they start giving birth, they're at home a few kilometers away from the hospital. So when the baby is born, they don't have time to actually go 30, 50 kilometers to that hospital to put the baby. So they need a solution at home. The solution is not in the hospital. The solution is at home. So this team of designers then created this baby warmer that warms up the baby's temperature and they managed to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Very cheap solution also for the, um, for, for the mothers living in that region. Another silly example is that push and pull door, right? So when you, when you see a door like this, so when, when you see a handle, our mind associates the handle with pulling. You want to pull automatically. When you don't see any handle, you have the automatic kind of association that you just have to push. And many times there's a stupid mistake, maybe, maybe you found it yourself, is that when I see this, I want to pull, but actually you have to push. It's so stupid. There are in, in, in a lot of toilets, actually in the public toilets, there are a lot of stupid systems like this. So this is like a really simple example of, you know, just really empathizing and observing what people do gives this insight that when you see something you want to pull, when you don't see anything you want to push. Okay, um, and then one final example of a failed product that didn't use design thinking. So everyone knows Google, I assume. <laughs> okay, so a few years back, I think it was 2011, Google has this innovative idea that we want to build Google Glass. So this is when kind of the, the smartphones were getting smarter, the computers were getting smarter, the, the smart watches or like the smart devices were trying, were, were developing. And Google thought, okay, let's make some smart glasses. So you would have the smart glasses and you would be able to see some popping information while you walk in the street and things like that. And they invested millions of dollars because they thought, okay, we're Google. Everyone knows that. If we build something, everyone will buy our product without talking to people, without testing anything. And then they released the product without any testing, without asking any potential customers and the product fails massively. So they completely invalidated this product. They lost millions of dollars. They lost a year in developing this because people actually don't want this. They don't want to, you know, walk on the street and be creeped out by some stuff popping in their eyes. It's not user friendly. So this is another example of when you're a little bit overconfident and you think you know best and you have the best idea and it actually fails. Okay, so this is the second principle of, uh, or the first principle of uh, design thinking, which was human-centered design. Second principle of design thinking is ex experimentation and prototyping. It's really about constantly um, trying and failing, trying and failing and learning. So when we talk about experimentation and prototyping, it's really about translating what you hear into products. So really listening and being able to create something based on the insights that you get. And in order to do that, I want to do a quick experiment with you. So the people who have, uh, the people who are remote, make sure that you have a piece of paper in your hand. So everyone who is offline, take one piece of post-it, please. Okay, so take a piece of paper and hold it in front of you and follow my instructions. Everyone close your eyes. Fold the paper in two. Fold the paper in two again. Okay. Tear the right top corner. So the top right corner, tear it a little bit. So can, close your eyes, please. <laughs> so cut it a little bit. On the top right corner, guys, everyone close their eyes, come on. 
the top right corner, the top right corner, the top right corner, just tear it. Yes, yes, it's folded and you just tear it. And you just follow my instructions, okay? Fold it again in two. Cut the paper in two. So rip it apart in two. Rip it, rip the paper in two. This is a new word. Can you say it in Vietnamese? Okay. Try. With only one piece of paper that is remaining in your hand, fold it again in two. Okay, everyone open your eyes and show your beautiful solutions. I wanna see what everyone has. Huh? The, the last one that was in your hand. Open it. If you want to open it, sure. Yeah. Let's see. Everyone, please show. Okay, look around. Okay. So this was, so this was my instruction for you. Okay. This was my instruction for you. I said the same words to everyone. Everyone understood them differently. Okay, this is a simple example that happens in real life when people tell you something and you interpret them through your own understanding without asking, oh, but how do I do it? Is it like this or like that, right? So this is the simple silly exercise just shows you what happens usually in real life when you try to build something without asking your customer, in this case me, what exactly I mean by several things, okay? So again, experimentation and prototyping so I'm gonna repeat this again when you build something just show it visualize it sketch it create a simple prototype test it with your customer before you build the final solution okay let's move on to the next okay that's done so this is another very interesting example from product development so product development teams always have this example because the customer explains it like this they tell you something the project leader understands it in one way, the analyst does something different, then we have the programmer who programs the solution in one way, the beta testers receive something else, the business consultant describes it like this, of course, the business consultant, um, the project's documented, no one ever documents anything, uh, what operations were installed, how the customer was built, maybe everyone, someone recognizes yourself in this picture, how it was supported, what marketing advertise, what, ex what the customer actually wanted. So this is a si really simple example that happens a lot in product development teams. Why? Because we all have our own biases. When you're a developer or a programmer, you're used to program, you're used to logical connections between different things. So you understand the world through this logical kind of framework. When you're a business consultant, you are educated and taught in a completely different way. So your way of describing and understanding things is completely different from how a programmer understands things. So this is why it's important to keep in mind that every one of us and all the people out there who are our potential customers, they all have their own biases. They all have their own backgrounds and they understand things differently and they also need different things. Okay, finally, uh, a bias towards action. What does this mean? So being prejudiced towards action. So instead of sitting in your meeting room, building, sketching things, writing Excel sheets, uh, writing a 200 page business plan, it's better to create a small prototype, do some action, create a small prototype, go out, test it, come back, iterate. So you really need to understand the problem first. And one way to do that is to follow this following process. So when you want to build something, let's say you have a startup and you want, you have a platform and you want to build a new feature in order to build that new feature. What do you want to know? 
what do you need to know in order to build it? You need to know what your customer thinks or your customer's expectations. You need to know about your technical team's um, uh, competence and you need to know about the time that you would need to develop. You need to know how much money would it cost. So it's important at the beginning of the design process to really ask yourself, what do you want to know? Second, what is already known? So you can have so much information online um, or through surveys, uh, through public data to really try to gather some initial information. If you want to build a dating app, for example, here is where you would have to do some research of what already exists out there uh, in other countries, maybe in other regions that are similar to what I want to build. So get some inspiration. Three, what is still unknown? What is still unknown out there? And you, can, you cannot find information. If it's a customer problem or a customer need or a customer experience, write it down here. How am I gonna find out? So are you gonna do interviews? Are you gonna do surveys? Are you gonna create a Facebook group and ask some questions there? Are you gonna call your customers? Are you gonna go and visit your customers at their office? So what is gonna be your method? of collecting all this information to answer your questions. How do you interpret new information? So once your customer is gonna give you some insights, how are you gonna process that information? And this is a really important part. And a lot of people miss that, documenting what you find out. If you have 10 interviews with 10 potential customers, document all 10 interviews to try to identify patterns, write them down, write down everything that you do with your customer because that documentation is going to be useful and important later in the process. You can come back to it and validate already some assumptions. Six, once you conduct your method, either it's a service or some interview, did it answer your question? If you interview 10 people and 10 of them validate, yes, I have that problem. Does this mean that it's validated? If only two people say that they have the problem, then what do you do? What's your plan for pivoting? And then finally, what are you gonna do with the answer? So once you receive insights from your customers, how are you gonna use them in your product development process, for example? Okay, any questions about this? If there are no questions, again, I assume everything is perfect. Everyone understands everything. You're able to say this with your eyes closed tomorrow. Yeah, okay, uh, next. So when you do field research, so when you do interviews, for example, or you do observations, what's to look for? Behavior that surprises your assumptions. So look for surprising insights. Many times what we do because we're human, we're trying to find information that we're comfortable with. So one example to give you is that on Facebook, we choose to read things that already validate our own assumptions. We don't wanna hear things that contradict our assumptions. So but in design thinking process, it's really important to look for contradictions, to things that we don't expect, to things that surprise us. Second, difference between what people say and what they do. So look for that. Many times what people say is not um, aligned with what people do. If you ask people, would you buy this app? They will always say yes. Will they actually buy it? Most likely no. So try to look for contradictions. If, for example, a person tells you let's say that you're trying to mm, look for, or you're, you're trying to test your prototype. You have an app and you want to test that prototype. What you could do is talk to the customer and ask them about different things and they will tell you many other things. And the second thing you can do is actually give them the prototype and say, please use it and walk me through it. So you don't do anything, you just let them use it. And then you can see differences between they actually say what they say and what they actually do. And third, um, look for the way people define their values and priorities. And this is important. When I say uh, punctuality is really important for me, what I mean by punctuality many times is different from other people think punctuality is. I'm gonna give an example. So in the last five years, I lived in a few countries and in Europe mainly. So in Europe, when you go to the north of Europe, Germany, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they are very punctual. This means that they want to be on time. They're always on time. If you go to the south of Europe, everyone is late. So if you say, let's meet at 10 a.m., everyone is gonna come at 
both of those people say that they're punctual, but the German person comes 10 minutes before the meeting and the Spanish person comes 15 minutes later after the meeting. And both of them say that they're punctual. So here it's about cultural differences, of course, but also differences in general. So when people tell you, in my planning experience, I really value uh, spontaneous activities. What you think of spontaneous activities are different from what the person tells you what spontaneous activities are. So this is why it's important at that point to ask that person, what do you mean by spontaneous? So always ask them, what do you mean by that? Even if it's a silly question, you know, what do you mean by that? Because their understanding most of the times is going to be different. Okay. And finally, uh, just do it. So when having the interviews, you don't have to plan so much in advance. It doesn't cost you anything. Just spend one day talking with six of your customers, having six interviews, six meetings of 30 minutes or one hour. And that will save you weeks and weeks of just planning and developing and writing Excel sheets and business plans. Do observations. So let's say that you want to improve the travel experience or you want to improve the airport experience here in Hanoi. And you want to see what kind of problems the people experience when they enter the airport. What you can do is go for a day there or for two or three hours and just observe what happens. I did this exercise in the Netherlands, I studied in Amsterdam, and in one of my projects, we had to do, uh, we had to improve the, um, the travel experience in the airport. So what we did, we went to the airport for one day, and we just sat down on a chair, and we took note of everything happening. What we found out is that mothers with little babies and a stroller and seven luggages next to them have a lot of trouble navigating the airport because it was not, the experience was not designed in a way to help people with a lot of luggage who have a lot of things in their hands to really navigate the airport. So we could design a solution for that. So really observe and try to find out who are the people who are struggling the most with a certain thing. And of course, you can do surveys. I really recommend not to start with surveys because in surveys, you would never get kind of the emotional aspect of what's happening. When you talk face to face to a person, you can see their fa facial expression, you can see if they're thinking, you can see if they're confused. You can really dig deeper into the answers. In the service, you cannot do that. So what I recommend to do usually in this process is to have some interviews first, let's say 10 interviews, and then take some assumptions, put them in a survey, and try to scale that up to 1,000 people or 100 people. So validate some initial assumptions, and then try to scale it up and see if it's also true for a bigger number of people. Okay, uh, and a final principle is to show and not tell. So when you test an app, instead of going and telling your customer, what I experience a lot of entrepreneurs do, and it's a, it's a big kind of, I don't wanna say the word mistake, but kind of a mistake, is that you enter this salesperson's shoes. You know? So you want to sell your product because you think it's the best and you want to convince everyone that they have to use it. Design thinking is very different. It's never selling. It's actually listening. So just show your app to, to the person that you want to test it with and ask them to use it in front of you and see what questions they have, what problems they have, what barriers they have in using it. So this is another you know, typical example is that when you sit in your room and you design something, you design this perfect path. And when you go out and you observe people, you see that they actually do something completely different. So that's really important to always check with your customer and always validate all the assumptions that you have. And then final principle of design thinking is the power of iteration. So iteration is really back and forth, back and forth with your customer. You build initial solution, you showed it to them, come back, iterate, go back out and do it. So this is, kind of how it should look like. So you build something here. You don't wait until you build the final product. Already test it here. Test it here because you're gonna get some learnings to improve this experience for the next iteration. In this iteration, you do something more advanced, test it again until you have your final product. Okay, so to summarize the five principles of design thinking, human-centered design, so really empathizing with your target group, putting yourself in the shoes of your target group, Experiment and prototype, so 
always build a prototype before building the final product to be able to gain more empathy and more insights from your target group. Bias towards action, so learning by doing, do something instead of thinking about it and planning it, just do a quick test and it will give you much more answers than you thinking in your head and guessing what the answer should be. Show, don't tell, so let the user experience your solution. Don't just tell them a perfect story of the solution, just show them the prototype and see what their feedback is. And then finally, power of iteration. So don't stay attached to the first idea. Um, really try to kind of be like a scientist of just uh, trying to kind of ask questions and validate different assumptions. A lot of entrepreneurs, if they build the solution first and then they try to test it, they fall in love with their solution. They're not so open to change it anymore. But if you do quick iterations from the beginning, you become more flexible and more adaptable and it's easier for you to change your solution based on feedback from your customer. A final thing that I want to share with you is that the perfect product or innovation happens at the intersection of three things. It's desirability, so it's the human-centered design. It's feasibility, it's about technology. Can, do we have the capacity? Do we have the technology to build this? And it's about viability, the business side. Can we actually have a sustainable business model out of this? If you have only two or only one, then no. Let's say if you have technology and desirable, it is usable, but it's not possible because no one is ready to pay for it. So when you do design thinking and you do different tests, you have to keep in mind these three aspects of your solution. It has to meet these three things in order to be a sustainable business model in the future. Okay, so this was it for this design thinking short session crash course. So what questions do you have about the information you just received about the process that you practiced? What questions come to your mind? Also the people online can um, ask questions in the chat. If there are no questions, I assume everything is clear. You're able to apply it tomorrow morning in your projects. Okay, so there is one question here about how can you do brainstorming if you're not such a creative person and you like to kind of stick with more traditional types of ideas. So I really don't think creativity is something that only some people have. Everyone is creative. You're just creative in different ways. Um, so when you do brainstorming, there are different techniques of kind of pushing you to get out of the comfort zone. So what we did today was really just three minutes of you coming up with a few ideas. If we would do an ideation session, we would spend two hours coming up with a few ideas. We'd spend 10 minutes doing one method, then another minute, then another 20 minutes or 10 minutes doing another method. So it's really not impossible. Most, most of the times you will get stuck at the beginning. So in the first 10 minutes of an ideation session, maybe you have only two or three ideas and you don't want to continue. But as I push you more with more uh, methods with more ideation, um, ideation tools and ideation methods, you will come up with some ideas. You would just not come up with in the first round, but in the second, third or fourth round, you will come up with more ideas. I also thought of myself of not being creative six years ago because I thought oh, I'm a dysfunctional person. I cannot do this, but it works. It, it's not such a thing that someone is not creative. I don't believe in that. <laughs> Okay, anyone else? No question is stupid, guys.
So there is one question about how do you balance getting feedback from the users with your own ideas of how the solution should be. Um, so it's a little bit of a tricky question because you cannot just talk with your users and that's it. You have to kind of come back to your company or to your team and try to process. So the best way to do it is to really have regular feedback checks with your team because in the end it's still the, your product that you're building. It's not that the customer is going to tell you make a blue button here in this platform the customer will never tell you that these are your decisions so what you have to keep in mind about your customers is the overall problem that you're trying to solve so kind of making sure that what you build solves their problem or they're ready to use it or to pay for it for example so it doesn't necessarily have to be this huge problem it can also be something that they need in their day-to-day -day lives um, so ultimately your solution needs to fulfill their problem, but how you do it, it's up to, to you and your team of how you actually build that. But an important thing is that you do regular checks. So you don't have to go out and talk to your customers every day. So you would have feedback sessions every month, for example, or every two weeks. I mean, depending on how big your product development um, yeah, cycle is, but what usually happens is that you build uh, over in, in sprints over two weeks. So in two weeks, the development team built something. And in those two weeks, the design team, for example, or the business team can spend time to validate certain things. So then the development team, the next two weeks can build something. So it's important just to have these cycles of you check, you build, you check, you build. So not relying a hundred percent, but like kind of creating a sort of a working framework for yourself that works best for your team. Checking. As I said before, you don't have to have the final product to build. You can build a prototype first. What's your product? You can fake it. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of a test. So the example that I give is of Zappos. It's a, probably one of the first e-commerce websites uh, in the US. So basically the guy who wanted to build a platform to buy shoes online, back then it was a new thing. No one bought things online. Uh, so he, he wanted to test, how can I do this? He cannot build this platform because it's too much money, it's too much time. As in your case, it would take him one year to build a platform. So what he did, instead of building the platform, he went to every single shop uh, near his neighborhood where they sell shoes. And they took a pic he took pictures of all the shoes. And then he created a landing page that you can do in one day, put those fake pictures there with a price tag. And then every time people would click order, he would go himself to the shop, buy the shoes and ship them. So he kind of faked this whole experience of an e-commerce uh, website. It took him a lot of effort and time, but he validated that that's what people want. That's actually possible instead of spending one year to build the platform. First, he validated for the first month and then he was like, okay, this is validated. Now I can ask for investment and actually build the, the full platform. So you can find ways 
to fake the experience. If your platform is Facebook, for example, you don't need 1 million users to test it. You can just fake it. You can just say, there are 500 users, put some fake pictures and names and show it to your customer and ask, hey, this is a new social media platform that does this and that. Would you like to sign up? And then they're like, yeah, I want to sign up. And then you test it with 20 people and then you validate, okay, people actually want to be part of this platform. Now I can go to the investor and ask for money to build this. So, and also that's how we work with investors as well. Investors will always ask you for traction and design thinking is a great way to gain that traction because you can say, I talked with 50 people, I talked with 30 people, with a hundred people and all of them signed up, fakely signed up to this platform. So we, I have to build this platform. I need, I don't know, $5,000 to get this started. Can you help me? So it's also a good way to gain traction like that. Any other questions? Yeah, so you will receive the slides after the session. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so if you don't have any more questions, if you have time, please fill in the feedback form. Uh, we always want to improve the sessions in the future and your feedback, positive or negative, will definitely help us make this a good experience. 